So hi Dan, how are you? I'm good Ricardo, how are you getting on? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good, thanks for today. Um, I just wanted to get your your story really. Um, I thought I'd just put together like um, just some just a podcast basically talking to founders like yourself and like myself. Um, I think it's important to get these stories out there um, just to help the other people that may be thinking of um, starting their own business or their own app or software solution, whichever. And it's good to kind of get um, how people started and where they are, um, just to give some a uh, little bit of insight, basically. So, like, I know we met a few months ago, um, initially through Black Valley, um, through Leke and his his organization, and um, I think you did a presentation on his um, initial uh, webinar that he did, and I thought, you know what, like, I like your idea. Um, we're in the same sector as well. So I thought, yeah, it'd be, it'd be good to connect. So do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's it's, it's great to to chat today. And, and yeah, I really like what you're doing. I think it's really important to share as many founder stories as, as we can, because to be honest, like the ones that get told the most are usually the ones um, that, you know, you think of, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs, et cetera. Exactly. And, and often people get, maybe sort of demoralized or, or shocked when they start doing working on a startup or, or something and it doesn't quite sort of rocket to the moon in, in the you know a few months into it and you know that's that's not the reality of it um but you can still be successful and and and, and achieve something um so yeah so um i'm dan and uh founder of evernox so Evernock uh, is a digital home moving platform. And um, so to sort of give you a bit of context, um, I I bought a, a, a home with my my now wife about five years ago. And um, it was just one of the most sort of stress and anxiety inducing processes that, that I'd, I had ever been through. And, and obviously it's a huge amount of money that you're putting into it. You save for, for years to get your deposit you find the right place, you get your offer accepted and you, you know, you're over the moon and, and you think, yeah, that's it. Fantastic. But what they don't tell you is that then from then you've got a, an awful long time between that point and actually getting your keys and, and being able to move in and call it your home. And yeah, for us, um, you know, it took 167 days, which is a, a number I refer to a lot in my, in my no day. Um, <laughs> And, you know, a lot of the time, if, if I'm honest, I had no idea why things were being held up. I really had no idea. Mm -hmm. I'd ask my solicitor, I'd ask my estate agent, um, but things just felt very hidden, um, very opaque. So, you know, after I'd been through this, um, so I was working in the city at the time. Um, and, you know, fortunately we, we got the keys in the end. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't lose any money and you know i know there are some people that have had worse stories than us but i just it always nagged at me that it was a uh the whole experience really tainted what was supposed to be an overwhelmingly positive milestone for for both of us mm -hmm. um so uh, you know a few years later um i decided i'd have enough of the city which uh, a lot of people do um and i decided that i wanted to, to sort of work in in a more sort of entrepreneurial path um and i worked at a couple of startups and then i i decided you know i want to do my own thing um and you're always at that that point when you when you want to decide what you want to do so most people either look at what they know or what they're good at um one of the things i like to do is look at problems that exist um mm -hmm. that affect me um and whether you know i feel that there's some some value I can add to to, to that and, and and help and create a solution. So, this has always nagged at me. I just thought terrible process. Why don't I I have a have a look at it? Um, so I spent a long time sort of just chatting to people that that knew about it, you know, more in depth than me. So apart from sort of buyers and sellers, um, I spoke to a lot of estate agents. I spoke to solicitors. Um, I spoke to you know researchers um who look at sort of real estate um and sort of innovations and, and things like that and it sort of struck me that there was no 
that, that this hadn't been figured out yet for some mm -hmm. reason um even though it's you know there's 1.2 million transactions a year um give or take you know as i said almost everyone has a very similar experience you know you'd mm -hmm. be hard pressed to find someone who was like yeah it was really great and really easy um and yet there still didn't seem to be uh, a great solution to it that sort of allowed everyone to to have a sort of a an understanding of what was going on and, and mm -hmm. you know a clear idea of when things would happen and, and what they need to do next etc so yeah so i decided to to try and create that solution myself basically as so, you do uh, exactly yeah. so that's that was that was the start um uh, of, of of evernock that's good so like from from you doing your own research speaking to other people about your idea and 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 the problem you're trying to solve what was the feedback you got um which kind of enabled you to will give you the motivation to say yeah i need to solve this yeah so um initially you know I spent because I, I I guess I figured that there must be something um, mm -hmm. and maybe it just hadn't sort of been it just wasn't well known enough or mm -hmm. I, I don't know or maybe I'd I just missed something so I, I did spend a lot of time honestly hoping that there already was a solution yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and I just I just the more people I spoke to them the more I realized that everyone recognized this as a problem um, but no one had spent time or, or no one had done anything that had a big enough impact on 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 solving it and i think there's a number of reasons why that is um you know it, from from my own perspective i think you know property's been around for a long time so it has people who have been in this industry an awful long time um and have always done things the same way and and let's be honest a lot of people who work in in the property industry have, have made a lot of good money over the years mm -hmm. you know generally in this country we've seen um you know almost uninterrupted um property price appreciation for the last you know however yep. 50 years or, or, or more yeah yeah um, yeah you know, i know we've had a couple of sort of blips in the last few years and from various things um but but in general most people who have worked in it have, have made money and therefore they thought well you know if, it, if it's not broke don't, don't fix it way, yeah yeah um, so yeah so so i the, the, they just hadn't there just didn't seem to be a, a great appetite to changing um mm -hmm. and to developing new ways of of, of thinking but you know I, th I think that's that's definitely changing now um mm -hmm. not just in sort of what we're looking at but there's a lot of really great companies that are trying to solve for various parts of the the transaction process um yeah and i think that's only a good thing for for the consumers and, and for the people that work in there as well no of course so d did you see like from the buyers and the seller side that they would prefer to have a faster transaction or is there some sort of benefit in it taking three or four months for it to 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 exchange yes yeah, so that's a really good question i think for the most part um especially from the buyers um people want it to, to go through as quickly as they can um mm -hmm. w with the caveat that they don't they don't want things missed so you mm -hmm. know at the end of the day it's it's a legal process and and it's there are there are things that have to be um you know carefully investigated to make sure that that you know because as we say it's a it's a big transaction it's a huge sum of money you don't mm -hmm. want things missed but assuming that you know you're, you're thorough and, and and all your searches and, and surveys and uh, 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 carried out properly and well then as far as i could see um you know 99 percent of of the people i spoke to at least wanted a you know the quicker the better basically yeah um, okay no one wants this hanging over their head for a long time that there are the odd occasion though where where you're right i think people um you know they they, they try and hold up the transaction for a number of reasons yeah. it's not something i ever really understood but but honestly it's it's also not something that i felt was was too important because it was a a really really small minority yeah um, and and it wasn't just the buyers and sellers you know estate agents um traditional estate agents at least get paid upon on completion right yeah. so yeah. in order to to you know improve 
that you know their sales cycle and and, and mm -hmm. have reduced it they want quicker sales the other thing is and what's been shown um time and again is that the longer a, a sale goes on the higher the chance there is of it collapsing right? yeah um, and as we know the 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 failure rate sits it's somewhere around 30 percent right? yeah and yeah that's a huge amount one in three fall through and so you know things are going on longer and longer and, and that fate that likelihood of, of it failing is um is increasing then of course it, it stands to reason that people want want it to be completed quicker or so you mm -hmm. think um and like i said for the estate agents they're losing you know if it falls through at any point the traditional estate agent what doesn't get paid so they may have worked for three or four months on something and yeah. won't, won't get anything um and and that's tough i know i know there's not always a a great sympathy for estate agents but you know it, it's <laughs> imagine going to work and working on something for three months and then not even getting paid for it you know that's, yeah that's tough um but but yeah but obviously the the consumers are the ones that, that that really lose out because um as we said you know often it's a it's a big sum of money and, and they may have already paid out on things like surveys and searches and solicitor yep. fees mm -hmm. um and and they may never see that money again and, and i think the average is 2700 pounds that people lose when a, when a sale falls through and you know, that's an awful lot of money not to have mm -hmm. to see again and then have to pay again if you find another place you know and it can happen again too so Absolutely. it's yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so so where does um Evernox sit in that in that process to 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 speed that up yeah um so it's really interesting i in my head i think when i first thought about this i was like you know i want to create a complete end-to-end -end solution and and to be honest that's still our ultimate goal mm -hmm. but one thing i found out quickly from speaking to a lot of people in the sort of the startup world i suppose is that it's very very difficult to do everything all at once and they said what you need to really do is find one or two things really urgent problems um, that you can solve or that you can do really well um, and then you know you can build from there you, you know if you have people who are willing to use and pay for your solution just when you do those one or two things really really well then you know you can you can get an engaged user base and, and you can build on that and and mm -hmm. you know when you think about it when you start looking back at at some of that you know the the apps and things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis they weren't built with all the bells and whistles right yeah. i remember i remember facebook when i was at university and it was um i hadn't even heard of it before i went because it was it was one of those things i think it, it was just getting rolled out to to uk universities and you could really barely do anything on it to be honest yeah, you sort of wrote yeah. your, your details you stuck a picture up and you wrote on people's walls and that was basically it mm -hmm. and it's like almost um i mean it is basically a completely different product to what it is now um mm -hmm. you know and obviously advertising is a huge huge part of that now but it wasn't back then mm -hmm. um so what we are focusing on at the moment with evernock is sort of as i said sort of two things so our aim is to really make the sales progression process um, as simplified and automated as possible. So sales progression is effectively what the uh, estate agent spends, you know, quite a lot of their time, sometimes around 20% of their, their working time doing. And it basically just means, you know, every, every week or so, um, they want to update all of the, the stakeholders so that they're, they're buyer and, and the seller what's going on find out where people are in the process um, and make sure things are moving along and, and not just you know being stalled and if there is a bottleneck sort of figuring out why mm -hmm. and incredibly even you know now in 2021 the process in which that's that's primarily done is through calling up uh, buyers sellers the solicitors of each party or emailing it's a little um, manual yeah and very manual and then sort of going round round the the roundabout and sort of and explaining to everyone what's going yeah, on and it, yeah it's, it's really inefficient um more than that you know people tend to because they're having these individual conversations people 
don't tend to be as open or honest with with exactly what's going on, especially on the solicitor side. Sometimes solicitors don't like the estate agent sort of butting in, um, mm-hmm. and 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 often, you know, phone calls, voicemails, emails just get ignored, and, yeah. and you know, therefore, you know, a lot of the time that the agents spending are just trying to like get through to people and and, and try and get uh, answers, and and that's you know, it's so inefficient, it's such a old school process that that it's um you know it, it seemed like an something that that could be that could be improved quite quite easily using sort of modern modern methods and mm-hmm. so Evernock is a platform that that effectively connects the the major stakeholders um so one of the great insights i found during our research was um whenever an, an estate agent was near the end of a of a sale and things were getting held up and they couldn't really figure out why and this actually i had this almost identical conversation with a number of agents they said what they would do is they'd send out an email to all the parties so both solicitors the buyer and the seller they'd cc everyone in on this email tell no one they were going to do it and basically call someone out for or, or, or try and call out where the bottleneck was and as you can imagine, that yeah. that often goes down like a lead, like a ton of bricks. <laughs> but it was the only way that they could draw out where the bottleneck was and and mm-hmm. and try and get things moving. Effectively, what we're doing is sort of bringing that process out from the start. So from the start, everyone is aware that you're all dialed into this platform. Everyone can see what you're working on, how far you've got, what's left to go, how long mm-hmm. you've been working on it. And it just keeps the, the lines of communication open and it, and it makes things really transparent. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, if I'm if I'm buying a, a house, for example, through an estate agent, they would then onboard me onto Evernock and then I'll be able to see where the um, where it is in, in, in the in the process, basically. Um, and w- would I be able to like uh, message any of the solicitors, message the estate agent, or was it literally just like a, just providing me transparency so I don't have to keep calling? Yeah, so, so at the moment it's, um, th- there's no messaging um, sort of, uh, there's no messaging service mm-hmm. built in. We did think about that, um, but we felt it might get a little bit messy, mm-hmm. um, at least at this stage. So at the moment, it, it's it's simply just about transparency. Um, okay. And the second part of it is um, is sort of an e- almost a, an education part. So, you know, as buyers and sellers, especially the buyers, they often don't actually know what it is they should be doing, um, mm-hmm. when they should be doing it. So, you know, what we're keen to do within the platform is really guide people through that, you know, almost like a handholding process and, and tell them exactly what needs to be done, what they should be doing and, and help them with, with clear advice and guidance on it, on it as well. Okay. Is that, and is that, is that for just the, just the buyer or is that also for the sellers also for the, okay. It's just, it's for the buyers and the sellers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so, and because these are the guys that in general are not doing this very often, you know, you, you move yeah, in. Okay on average, I think mm-hmm. seven or eight times in your lifetime. So it's not something yeah. that's done very much. Um, the estate agents hopefully should know what's going on because <laughs> they do this on a daily basis and, and similarly with the solicitors. Okay. So like um, being able to create this create this solution um, and you're presenting it to obviously the solicitors and estate agents, what's, what's their response to it so far? Yeah, so... Um, I went to the estate agents first. It, it was the it was the the users that I'd sort of had, uh, you know, initial ins with already. So I thought it was, it was a good starting place, and I also thought that you know they were the probably the first ones in on the journey. So, you know, when you think about selling your house, you go to your estate agent. When you think about buying the house, you go to the estate agent. So, mm-hmm. so they were sort of the focal point, and the solicitors didn't come probably till later, um, and. Honestly, the estate agents, a lot of them said, you know, if, if this works like it's, you, you know, you think it will and you say it will and, and people are engaging with it, this is great. It will save us a huge amount of time. Um, we won't have to spend time calling rounds, which as I said, can be up to 20% of their day. They'd much mm-hmm. rather spend that time 
doing viewings, doing more valuations, things are going to, you know, directly increase their bottom line. Of course. Line. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the response for them has been great. Similarly, from the buyers and sellers, um, we've had more difficulty from the solicitors. Um, <laughs> it has been, it has been, it's been tough, honestly. Um, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think it's one of two. Th so we're sort of going through a really, really unique period at the moment. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're in the middle of a global pandemic, um, mm -hmm. but specifically in the property market, we've had this stamp duty holiday that's just sort of caused chaos. Mm -hmm. And what it's meant is that solicitors who are usually sort of bidding for business effectively through estate agents or, you know, other methods, mm -hmm. they don't want it anymore because they're so inundated with work. They're so, they're at over capacity. Yeah. You know, they may still have, you know, probably not as much anymore, but certainly sort of last year, a lot of them were, were had less staff anyway because, you know, people were off sick. Yeah. For, yeah. For COVID purposes, people might have been on furlough, et cetera. So, you know, they, they were really over capacity. So the last thing they wanted was some startup founder who uh, <laughs> <laughs> to come along and, and say to them, look, everything you've been doing for the last 20 years is wrong. <laughs> we're going to make it better. And obviously, I, you know, <laughs> I would have never have said it like that. But, um, you know, ultimately what I what I did say to them was, you know, we, we think we can help you be more efficient because we know you're spending a lot of time um, having to chase clients, tell them what they should be doing, um, what they want, what they need to send you, etc. You know, let us take care of that portion of it and you spend the time doing what you're trained to do, which is, you know, legal due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that would be enough, if I'm honest. Um, but it it wasn't um or it hasn't proved to be at least this far mm -hmm. um i think whenever you're introducing like a new platform or software to, to anyone um you need to have a really good reason for them to to, to have an additional you know bit of kit and i think mm -hmm. the legal sector in general is a is probably a little bit skeptical to to taking on these new new bits of uh, software that's what we found anyway um so it's been difficult it's been difficult getting the solicitors on board and, and actually it's sort of you know we, we did try for a long time and we had good conversations with people but ultimately conversations are cheap and, and you need people to start using yeah them. so we, we onboarded some onto the platform but that's good we, just, we found their engagement was just not good enough um oh, okay because their engagement wasn't good enough we felt it had a, a detrimental impact on on the effect of the, the whole platform. So we made a decision a few weeks ago, actually, to 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 try and leave them out of it initially. Um, so to focus on really adding value for the buyers and sellers. Okay. Um, and you know, it's still in our roadmap to bring on solicitors. Yeah. But you know, we think if we can make this a a really really great product for buyers sellers and estate agents then eventually you know when when solicitors do have capacity when when they see the effectiveness that it has mm -hmm. then and hopefully that will be a much much easier sell later and i think that's that's an important lesson to learn as well as a founder is is being able to um be flexible enough to pivot because sometimes you do have an idea in your head and you, as you're trying to implement it um, it's a lot more difficult than you expected. There's a lot more moving parts that don't want to move, for example, as you just explained. And just by kind of taking them out the process, you can actually still provide value um, for the users. So with, with that, for example, I'm just thinking if, 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 the, if the solicitors are essentially the bottleneck as to why it's being delayed so much, how would, um, how would it help? How would it speed things up if they're not included? into into that process yeah sure so you know we've got to remember that without evernock things you know sales get completed still yeah every, yeah of course <laughs> they might take a long time but they do um so clients so buyers and sellers are still talking to their solicitors um mm -hmm. some of them actually have you know some of the solicitors actually have pr pretty decent um 
CRM so that that speak to oh, their okay. clients. Yeah. Um, so all we're asking to do at this st stage is for rather than for the solicitor to be updating their their point in the platform directly, the the buyer and seller will effectively update on their behalf. Um, okay. And you know the reason they'll do that is because we're adding value to them in mm -hmm. other ways um and hopefully you know it's also like a uh if, if they're if you're a buyer and you're willing to to, to do that from your side then mm -hmm. you expect the seller is also willing to do that and buyers and sellers want to see exactly what the other side are doing because at the moment they don't know what the other side is yeah doing. and it creates yeah. you know it's that sort of that lack of transparency that we said it causes huge problems so so that's that's our sort of thesis at the moment and I guess we'll find out how, how right it is. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing how it works, actually. Um, I mean, yeah, you, what you're solving is a, is, is a big problem. And if it can be um, sped up and more transparent, I can't see why um, all estate agents wouldn't use it, you see. Um, in terms of like the actual uh, business side of it, is it, do you run it all on your own or have you got a, a team that, that help you build it? Yeah, so um, when I basically decided that uh, you know I wanted something built to to test out what what I thought was was going to be the product, you know I I, I found an agency um, to, to to build an MVP for me. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work out, and um, you know, long story short, it, it took about a year of uh, of of them pretty much sort of palming me off to to figure out that. Uh, the agency route wasn't going to work for me so um you know we had wireframes we had designs um i thought we were close to to a product um mm -hmm. but it turns out we weren't really so you know i, I was probably pretty naive at the time um but it was, it was a lesson learned and um you know after a year i sort of said look enough is enough um, and, I, and I pulled the plug with them. So what I did is I actually reached out to my my network, my LinkedIn network, mm -hmm. and my personal network as well. And I just kind of said, you know, anyone that I knew was in sort of tech or, or, or developers or anything like that. And I basically, over the course of about three or four weeks, I had like loads and loads of really? chats. Um, mainly went to meet people in coffee shops or at pubs. Mm -hmm. This is sort of just pre-pandemic so it was uh back <laughs> when uh, there wasn't there was more social interactions which was nice mm -hmm. um and you know actually the one thing i learned is that everyone's really really helpful um and eventually what happened is i i had a coffee with a guy i was at university with um and you know he sort of said yeah you know if i think of anything i'll i'll, I'll let you know he was a, he's a product designer okay um, and a couple of weeks later he reached out to me and he said you know I, I really like what you're doing i like like the idea um i'd sort of like to to help you um build that first mvp out um and he had a friend that he he used to work with in another startup called alex um alex is a, a developer a ruby developer um so he said you know i'm going to reach out to him we're always looking for for opportunities to work together because they enjoy working together okay and make a good team um so i said yeah let's let's all jump on a call and and, and chat about it and mm -hmm. and yeah we did um he also really liked the the concept and, and what we're trying to do um and this was just around the time of of the first lockdown so obviously okay things were were this was march 2020 and, and things were were sort of going a bit crazy in the outside world but mm -hmm. as far as we were concerned you know, this was a good opportunity for, for us to, to work together. You know, it was all done remotely. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so so we built out, during the first lockdown, we, we basically built an MVP. Um, and then the property market closed for three months. <laughs> but that sort of, it gave us the opportunity to to do stuff without worrying about yeah. timing and everything like that. Um, yeah. And then sort of in the summer, um, when things was just opening up again, I was able to to show what we built to to some early users and and find out what what they thought of it and and yeah so um, so yeah I've been working with with Alex um, who who built it himself he yeah. mm -hmm. he was he was a well he is a back end developer by sort of generally but but he did the front end as well um, mm -hmm. 
and it's you know he's done it really well um but we worked closely with dan who's a really really talented product designer and i think that made it easy for him to do that nice. and then um a few sort of we, we we iterated a few times as well um dan had some some uh got a couple of uh, people involved as interns as well so a, a junior product designer called georgia she's did some work with us and she was great nice. as well and also his brother did some um some sort of junior development work as well as sort of software mm -hmm. development work um called brad so so yeah the the, the three of team. us have, uh, have, have done it yeah um and then we've had a couple of interns over the over the journey um so did you uh, and then sorry, carry on. <clears throat> sorry. no I was, I was just gonna say and then um we've also sort of um had a lot of advisors but but we're now we've got sort of a few that are helping me on a regular basis mm -hmm. um a couple of guys that started a very similar company actually funnily enough really like five six years ago mm -hmm. and they were probably you know they were onto something but they were probably just a little bit too early a little bit too early <clears throat> and i reached out to them when i saw they'd exited their company and said do you mind sharing your experience and um so this is Owen uh, and, and Steve and and they were really open about it um mm -hmm. you know spoke to me about what they thought was good what didn't work the mistakes they made etc um and yeah we, we we kept in touch spoke a few more times and I sort of said you know are you guys keen to sort of join as 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 advisors in in a more official capacity wow. and, and and they were and and that's been been massive as well so I know it's sort of like we talk about team advisors, but actually, you know, I, I speak to them a lot um, and, I, and I feel like they're part of my team as well. That's really good. Yeah. So in terms of like you're the, the developers, did you have to bring them on as co-founders or um, are they essentially like employed? Uh, no, I didn't have to bring them on as co-founders. I mean, I had I had an initial conversation whether they had any, any expectation of that, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't. Um, I think I wasn't against it, but they sort of were of the thinking that look, we we don't know what this is going to be like, but it sounds cool. Let's give it mm -hmm. a try. Let's let's see where it goes. So there's no need to sort of do anything like that at this point. Um, okay. And they were happy to sort of be uh, contracted. Um, so so they're all contracted um, and and have been and, and and still are on. You know, whenever we we do more development work um wow. so yeah and the aim after us our, our, our fundraisers is, is going to be to to bring them on full time and and, and to to increase nice. the team count as well how's that been going i know that's in terms of when i speak to other founders and stuff is when it comes to raising finance that's usually um the hardest part as they like to describe but well, what's your experience been like <laughs> yeah um i think I massively underestimated <laughs> what it was going to be like. Um, again, like I think it's a bit like we were talking about the founder story and it gets sort of romanticized and simplified, but you read all these stories about, oh yeah, these guys raised X million off no idea, no revenue, whatever. And you think, oh, this should, this should be fairly straightforward, <laughs> but it's, um, it's, one thing is like it's it's really sort of out of your sort of comfort zone because mm -hmm. and, and this is coming from i mean not I, I worked in finance i mean i was i was a trader but i i worked and i understand finance um and i worked there for, for seven odd years but understanding sort of startup investment and fundraising has been a, a an education in itself mm -hmm. um it really takes a long time and i've spoken to a lot of investors vcs angels etc um to really understand what it is that people are looking for and mm -hmm. you know so it's taken up a huge portion of my time i mean it's basically a full-time job on its own yeah just to get the funding <laughs> yeah it, re it really is um they do say that the first one is the hardest one um yeah and that makes sense because usually you're the business is is a lot more sort of immature and mm -hmm. you know from our point of view we have a product but we're pre-revenue we're running pilots yeah um you know any future raises that you might be fortunate enough to do would be presumably at once you've got some revenue some real traction and stuff so 
it's definitely been been tough but it's it's been an eye-opening experience as well um mm-hmm. we are still going <laughs> we're yeah, still yeah, yeah. still trying to close the round out um we've got one commitment um Good. which actually we got uh in the, the start of this year so mm-hmm. i thought i thought once we got that down that, that the the floodgates would open but it hasn't really happened like that mm-hmm. but that's that's not to say that you know we're still really positive we're still really optimistic um mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm having some really good conversations at the moment and trying to ramp it up and, and really put a deadline on it um to, tr- to try and get to our target is it is it essential that um you do raise your seed round or can it be bootstrapped we've bootstrapped to this point Mm -hmm. um and you know i think we've done a pretty good job and i think we've got relatively far um i think if we're realistic about meeting our our growth targets Mm -hmm. then we we need um some sort of fundraising um you know we've got a target of of 400,000 that we're raising mm-hmm. um you know i'm 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 sure we could look at look at the business plan and you know maybe lower some of our our targets cuz you know we, we want to be ambitious you know i want to i'm not in this to grow a small business i'm in this to grow big you know industry defining business mm-hmm. um but for sure we can sort of look at ways in which we can make it work off a slightly smaller raise if it comes to that um mm-hmm. but we're not quite there yet um but certainly something something we'll need to give i think yeah well it's good that you've got one commitment so far so you sure you're on your way there if it, if if you didn't get any then <laughs> i suppose you just start questioning whether whether it's whether it's supposed um a good business is um I suppose the position that I'm in now with my with my app is I'm still weighing up the pros and cons as to go for um, the funding route or literally just to kind of angel invest it and just fund it myself essentially. Um, Cause I suppose that it's two different animals um, depending on whether you go, whichever route you go really. But yeah, that's, 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 that's really good. Yeah, I think, I think there are uh... That there, there are strings attached with taking money from outside mm-hmm. investors and i think i've spoken to a lot of people that have, that have made it clear to me that you can't go into it naively thinking that you can take people's money and and, and it won't be you know there, there a lot of things will be made easier but a lot of things will be harder as well so that of will course. create new challenges you know yeah you won't yeah. be struggling to to find money to to develop maybe but you know you will have to drive growth quicker or you might have yep. to you know, bring revenue in quicker than you may have liked um, yep. you know at the expense of of user growth or whatever it is so mm-hmm. yeah it's definitely something to think about carefully um before and as i said it takes up so much time of your time anyway so you know yep, that's yep. time away from working on the product and the business so yeah you've really got to weigh it all up that's good so if if for example um if you had one piece of advice you'd give to anyone out there who's got an idea or saw a problem they want to solve, for example, what would it be? Yeah, um, look, I'm I'm an optimist at heart, you know, mm-hmm. um, and I'm I'm a I'd say I, I'm not I, I like risk. So <laughs> starting a business, starting anything, um, leaving a, a comfortable job is mm-hmm. is always a risk. Um, but if it's something that you're really passionate about and that you really think will have a, a positive impact, then I, I think just go for it. Um, and that doesn't mean quit your quit your job tomorrow and uh, <laughs> and put all your eggs in one basket. You know, by all means, lots of people, um, you know, stay in their jobs until they can afford to pay themselves or, or, or find out whether they've got an actual business on their hands. So. Mm-hmm. But definitely, tr- you know, try things, try things. Because, of course, like one thing that, you know, it's starting to be talked about more, but but generally is still misunderstood outside of um, entrepreneurs is that most startup founders like fail, like 
generally people fail. There's way more failures than successes, but that shouldn't deter you because, you know, every failure takes you one step closer to, to success because you'll mm-hmm. have learned so much from it. So don't be afraid to try, try and fail, try and fail again. Yeah. Try and fail until you, you try and, and you figure it out because, um, you know, that, that's the only way that, that, that will make sort of real positive change in, in, in anything, I think. So yeah, just, just basically try stuff, just try yeah. stuff and don't be afraid to fail. I like that. I like that. Perfect. So yeah. Thank you for today. Thank you a lot for today. Um, for people, if I had a quick question, actually, um, I know you're still uh, raising funds. Are you open to more investors um, or do they have to kind of come through specific channels? No, not at all. Um, you know, we're we're speaking to funds and angels. Um, okay. And, you know, angels are, you know, their ticket sizes are obviously a lot smaller than the normal funds. So yeah, anyone who is interested in, in sort of joining us on our, our, our journey nice. would be happy to, to chat to, um, you know, um, so yeah, just, just feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, where can they find that, you? Yeah. So, um, Dan at evernock.com is, is my email. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, um, Daniel Awaystein and, um, and Evernox on LinkedIn, Evernox on Twitter. Um, so yeah, just just reach out Perfect. at any of those channels, and uh, I'll be I'll be happy to chat. Happy to chat, and and I'm Good. also happy to chat to um to any founders that have have any, have any questions about about anything. And you know, I'm always always happy to chat. And, and we also do um Lecky and I actually do a uh, a clubhouse um, every Friday with with um, a few other founders. It's basically just a casual chat and. You know, Ricardo, it'd be good to, to have yeah. you there as well. Send me the link. Um, Send me the link. I'm on Clubhouse. Yeah, we'll do. It's um it's seven o'clock on, on a Friday on, on Clubhouse. So uh, okay. yeah, it's, it's a cool, cool, cool opportunity to just to have a chat, honestly. Uh, yeah. Start yeah. yeah. I'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, take care. And um, yeah. I, I know I would love to like um catch up again uh, later in the year and see where things are as well. Like I think is 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 good to kind of um uh kind of further on the story for people that want to follow so yeah awesome yeah no it's been it's been great chatting to you and um yeah i'm excited to to see your app as well and uh yeah, yeah happy it's to coming soon um, <laughs> later in the year and, and hopefully i'll i'll have some some positive positive news at that point definitely so, yeah. definitely okay. well thank you all right then cheers take care all right take care So if you enjoyed this podcast and you want to hear more of my content, just click the link below and subscribe to my channel. Also follow me on all my social pages.